Well, hello everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about autism and sleep deprivation, particularly for those who are on the spectrum and those who are caretakers or parents of autism. And I need to emphasize too that autism is a spectrum and your mileage may vary with these tips. Uh, the first thing I wanna mention is this affects a lot of autistic people. About 80% of those on the spectrum are affected with sleep disorders of some kind, whether it's insomnia or night terrors or just bad REM patterns or whatever it may be, they just lose a lot of sleep and so do their parents. So yeah, insomnia has been something that my youngest has struggled with. Alistair struggled with very much. He keeps just popping out of bed, he'll cry. Um, it's very dry here in Utah, so sometimes he'll get a bloody nose and he'll get really upset if that happens and he'll come try to you know wake us up. It's a bloody nose apocalypse, help! It's not the apocalypse, buddy, it's just a bloody nose. Ugh. Here, give me your hand. The apocalypse is happening. No, it's not. It's just your nose, buddy. I love you. And it could be midnight. It could be 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And, you know, Brittany has to get up for work at 6.30, and I have to get the kids off to school. And so it's just one of those things where we lose a lot of sleep, right? And he does too. And it makes him fussy, and that's not fun for anybody. So with Ian, um, he, when he was little, he used to have night terrors. And you can look that up, but it's really, really awful and no one, both the person experiencing it and the parents should have to go through that. It's an awful experience and we're glad he doesn't have night terrors anymore. So what are these tips and tricks of which I speak to help your autistic kid get better sleep? Well, one of the first ones that you generally hear about, probably one of the most typical ones is melatonin and or medication. My advice with this stuff is to do your research, of course, but also just kind of start small, right? And then work your way up if you find it helpful. The problem is like what with us and our melatonin experience is at first it helped our kids, but then they got used to it and then they required more. And then sometimes it wouldn't do anything. And then sometimes I think this is weird. It would have like the reverse effect and they'd stay up late. So we just kind of didn't really gel well with the whole melatonin thing. We just stopped having our kids take it. And for, for some people, the melatonin liquid works, the gummies work. That's great. Uh, with our oldest, he's the only one who's taken medication and he was on Risperidone and that was great for his sleep, um, but it also made him drowsy during the day. So just be aware of that. Another thing to focus on too is before bedtime, what happens throughout the day? Are they getting enough exercise, enough activity? Are they getting their wiggles out? They are just ninjas trying to release their wiggles. Are they getting enough sensory input and enough sensory output? And if you don't know what that means, it's basically a lot of people on the spectrum crave a lot of sensory input, whether that's, you know, flashing lights or, you know, touching textures or, you know, having kind of forward mobility or moving their fingers or hands or getting engaged in an activity where there's a lot of sensory experience. And likewise, sometimes they need to get that out of their system. They might be getting fussy or you know, aggravated or something like that. And they want to get those negative wiggles out, right? Um, some people have described it as feeling like there's little ants crawling all over their bodies. So you're going to have to kind of fill that out as an autism parent, you know, what, what their thresholds are, whether they're, they're stimming, you know, their, their motor movements and things like that, whether that's happy stimming or agitated stimming. It's just, I know it sounds a little bit complex, but it's something you have to feel out as an autism caretaker. And then taking that information and saying, do we need to, to pivot? Do we need to make adjustments to help sure, ensure excuse me, that our child is getting the sensory input or output they need? Um, another thing is nighttime routines. And this is a huge thing, right? Engaging that Pavlovian response to help your kid get ready for bed, get into that mind space. And sometimes that could be a little warning too, like, hey, we got 30 minutes before bed, wrap up whatever you're doing. And they start getting into that mindset, getting them in their jammies, brushing their teeth, um, any other routines they have, whether it's a stuffed animal, weighted blanket, that can be really, really huge. Ian loves his weighted blanket that helps him get settled down. Um, something we do in our family is we sing our kids hymns at night, and Brittany's really good at doing that. I am a child of God, and he has sent me. Lay down, buddy. Lay down. Uh, sometimes we'll do prayers. Uh, sometimes they'll want a story. It just depends on the child, um, but anything you can do to help them get into that mindset that we're closing up shop. Speaking of which, uh, my friends and I, when we were teenagers, we used to hang out at this restaurant and whenever they wanted to get rid of us, <laughs> they would blare loud music and they would turn down the lights. And that was kind of like, 
hey, dummies, it's time to get out. <laughs> so th that's very much a thing, right? Conditioning, trying to get people into the, the mindset of sleep. So whatever your routines are, um, just make sure you stick to them and your kids will be more apt to stick with their bedtimes as well. Now let's transition over to autism parents or, or caretakers. Now, this to me is, is kind of just like what anyone would do to get better sleep if they're feeling insomnia or something like that. Um, one thing that we do, and we exercise a word of caution here about over dependencies, but my wife and I sometimes will take those sleeping pills and it basically has the same active ingredient as Benadryl, but we'll take those if we really need to sleep. We have an important meeting in the morning, something like that. Um, sometimes we drink caffeinated beverages in the morning. Um, again, be careful of over dependencies. I feel like I drink too much energy drinks and that's something I need to fix in my life, right? We all have adjustments we need to make. <laughs> what I would say a huge investment, if you can make it, and I would encourage anyone with any kind of good income situation to really, really think about this, invest in a good mattress. Now, I know that seems a little bit excessive. Some mattresses can cost up to like 10 grand. Ours didn't cost that much, but it cost a lot of money. And the reason is, is because I had a friend at work who convinced me. He said, how much time do you spend in your office chair and how much time do you spend in your bed? And when I thought about it, I was like, well, geez, like we're talking like the majority of my life is spent in an office chair in my bed. And he's like, right, so shouldn't you be investing more money into those things? And I'm not gonna give any name brands or anything like that. Everyone has different opinions, like Purple Mattress or Sleep Number or, you know, Serta, 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 Posturepedic, I think that's how I say it. Anyway, there's a lot of brands out there and a lot of different things that could help you, but find something that helps you sleep better and invest in that because think about how much is a good night's sleep worth? How much is a week's night of good sleep worth? How much is a year's worth of good night's sleep worth? So on and so forth. Along with the mattress, I would say, do not let your kids sleep with you. Maybe when they're like little or tiny or something like that and they're nursing. I, I think this is good advice for any parent-child relationship. Um, some parents, they just get into this habit of breaking down and saying, all right, kiddo, you can sleep with me. Maybe they saw a shadow on their wall and they got scared or something like that. But as much as possible, try to ferberize your child, get them out of your bedroom and into their bedroom and create a space in there where it's, it's dark, but not too dark and it's quiet and they can just kind of shut themselves down without relying on mom and dad to get them to sleep. Because if you keep conditioning your child to sleep in your bed, you, that's it, right? You're going to get an elbow to the face at night. You're going to get a knee to the rib or a punch to the face. You know, you're just not going to get a lot of sleep if your child's sitting there poking you in the eye or the ear, whatever it might be. And so I would strongly suggest getting your kid out of the bedroom. I know this is hard for a lot of moms to hear, especially, uh, but please really consider that. You'll get better sleep in the long run. Another thing too is Alistair, when he wakes up in the middle of the night, something we found that helped us was putting a lock on our bedroom door. Now that doesn't mean we just flat out ignore him. Like if he has a bloody nose and he says, mom, dad, my nose is bleeding, we'll come out and we'll help him. But what it does is it establishes a very firm boundary, which is mom and dad are sleeping, the door is locked, you're not coming in here, right? And he gets that message loud and clear every time he tries to turn that knob and we're just like, nope, go to bed, it's bedtime. This is done. We've talked about this. We sang you a song, you know, read you a story. This is over. Go to bed. And I would say eight times out of 10, that's enough for him. He's like, okay, the door's closed, right? It's kind of like uh, if you're in the mall or something like that and those gates come down over the stores. It's like, this is pretty much a, a firm realization that things are shutting down. This is over. That was a, a weird analogy. But anyway, you understand. So I'm sure I left out a lot of tips and stuff like that. And please let us know in the comments what things work for you. It will help the community greatly. And also please be sure to check out our other video about autism and black eyes. Um, this is something that's kind of an ongoing thing we're researching is why do people with autism have these big dark circles under their eyes? And I don't think it's just sleep related, although that could be a part of it. So please be sure to check out that video and leave comments there as well. And with that, that's the video. We appreciate all that you guys do. You're awesome subscribers. And if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. And we will see you in the next video.